Colin, welcome to the All Things Risk podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on, and I think we're going to have a fabulous conversation. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Ben. Really pleased to be here. I'm a big fan of the show, so it's nice to be on it. Great. Thank you. So look, let's start with a little bit of who you are and what you do. I think that would be useful for my listeners to place you and your background. Sure. Great. Um, and let me just start off by apologizing if I sound a bit gruff. Uh, I've got a bit of a sore throat, like so many people around in the world at the moment. Um, so I'm basically a media safety advisor. I've been doing this for about 20 years now. And essentially what I do is I look after journalists as they work, journalists and content makers and podcasters as they work in higher risk locations or they do higher risk investigations or anything that could, can cause them harm or injury or even death, basically. Mm -hmm. And I go into news organizations and I help them build the infrastructure by which they manage risk. Great. Okay. And how did you get into this? How did you find yourself doing this? What, what is it that you wanted to do when you set out to start a career? Yes, yeah, so when I started my career, I, I had no idea this role existed, right? And I didn't have any sort of plan when I left university. I had um, studied a degree in international relations, but I had focused in particular on terrorism and Islamic fundamentalism. And when I graduated in 2000, I couldn't get a job or a paying job. I interned at the United Nations in London for a while. And, uh, but I really wanted to be a journalist and I um, was applying for jobs left, right and center in, uh, in the BBC, which was something I'd always aspired to. And I did some dreadful interviews, quite frankly. Um, I don't even know how they let me be interviewed for some of the roles I applied for. Um, but then this job came up on the safe, safety team, on the security team. This is the high-risk security team. And it was for an analyst uh, with an understanding of what was going on in the Middle East and um, in particular Islamic fundamentalism. And I got that role and I thought I will do this for you know, six months to a year and then they'll realize I'm, I'm a you know, really good prospect for, to be a journalist. And obviously 20 years, I'm st 20 years later, I'm still in security. Uh, but the amazing thing about the BBC is you get to pursue um, different opportunities. And I was a producer for BBC Newsnight and uh, Radio Current Affairs and also World TV for quite a while as well. So I got to work on the stories I like to work on. Uh, I got to travel the world and I did everything from wildlife filmmaking. So I helped make the first planet Earth, for example, uh, to, you know, the hard hitting news that you see on TV, to Panorama, to all the investigations. So it was a great ride, mm. quite frankly. And wow. then I um, went off to work for the BBC's rival during the height of the Arab Spring. And in 2016, I set up a company with a colleague of mine. Um, and now we support a number of different news organizations. I think it's up to 20 news uh, organizations that we're mm -hmm. retained by um, and different NGOs as well uh, to support them as they make content in higher risk locations. Fantastic, super interesting background. And it just continues the theme that we have on the show is that the some of the most interesting people in the world are those that didn't quite have a linear career trajectory and found different things and niches based on the experience that they had. So uh, it, it is fascinating to hear your background. Maybe we could start by talking a little bit around some of the considerations that go into producing a, a show. Uh, whether it's a news show or a documentary, and you mentioned high risk environments and what goes, what goes into that? So, I mean, journalism and content production has always been a dangerous game, right? And uh, journalists in particular, photojournalists and camera people, they have to be really close up to the action in the, in the face of the action, so to speak, to get the shots that you watch on, on the news in the evening. So that by itself just uh, reeks of risk effectively. And for a very long time in news, there was this attitude that basically, you know, the journalists went out the door, they were the experts on risk, mm. they managed their own situations, and they effectively were left to their own devices once they were in the field. And there was quite a high attrition rates in different conflicts for journalists. Uh, but the Balkans, 
in the 90s was a particularly high um, death count, mainly because a number of journalists were just able to access that conflict zone very easily from Europe. And a, a incident happened um, in uh, involving a journalist called Schofield at the BBC, John Schofield, and John Schofield was killed in the Balkans. And the first that his bosses knew that he had been killed was when they heard it being announced on the radio uh, in the morning. They didn't even realize that he had been sent to the Balkans to cover the story. And he had no hostile environment training. He had no experience uh, and there was no sort of management structure for him. And so the BBC sat down, they had a really long, hard look at themselves and they said, this just can't happen in this way. And so they started building a structure, which I then joined uh, very early on in. And uh, we now train our journalists, we train the management, have a, a, a structure of risk assessment that looks at the decisions we make as we're making them in real time. And we basically apply a risk assessment methodology to everything we do. And uh, then people go out in the field, there's mitigation uh, of the risk with the, um, you know, that accompanies them. So we'll put security advisors in the field with them. Um, we have extensive insurance. Uh, we jump through a lot of hoops basically to keep them safe. And if something does happen, which it does because we're working in dangerous areas, we analyze what's happened, we learn the lessons from what's happened and we uh, apply them in the, our next deployment basically. If we think about a, a conflict, just think about Russia, Ukraine, or the situation in, in Gaza, how do journalists get access to those, to, to maybe going either behind enemy lines or, or negotiating, uh, getting themselves into um, places where civilians may not be able or, or certainly willing, but be able to get to what, what goes into, what were the sort of the, I don't know, the tricks of the trade, if you like, or the, or the, the ways in which journalists get access to areas where they can report and cover. Okay. So, I mean, there, there are several types of journalists, uh, but let's just look at sort of news journalists, which is when there are these breaking news stories like the Russia, Ukraine war or, uh, Gaza, it tends to be, uh, breaking news, um, journalists from either TV, print, um, or radio. And so there'll already be a population of journalists in the location, right? These are the local journalists who are covering their story. So taking the Ukraine, there's a, a very strong tradition of journalism and a strong fraternity of journalists in, in Ukraine who have been covering the war, not since 2022, they've been covering it since 2014. And while some of us went there in 2014, um, and looked around once the story sort of fell off the international headlines, we left and uh, came back, parachuted in, but the local journalists have been covering it um, for nearly 10 years now, mm. or 10 years this year, I should say. And um, basically what will happen is when the story is breaking, uh, so in the case of the Ukraine, we knew that there was a buildup of Russian troops on the border because the US was telling us mm -hmm. that we didn't quite believe that they would invade, but we had uh, put large numbers of journalists into Kyiv and different parts of the Ukraine. And then when the invasion actually started, um, we were in a better place to cover it because we had the people there. Uh, but then it became a question of, one, do we have enough people there to cover this massive story, this massive invasion? And two, are they safe there? Do we need to pull them out? How do we pull them out if the, uh, you know, in Kyiv, we had people, you know, we were having discussions about what happens if the Russian uh, soldiers walk into the office or Chechen troops, if they run into Chechen troops in the street of Kyiv. Um, what would we do if they were um, arrested by Russians? So those are the kind of questions we're having. And we are working with the senior management of the, our clients to say, Let's have a, a bolt hole that they can go to if it looks like Kiev's going to fall, which is not necessarily that far away from Kiev, but it just gives us a chance to get out, reassess and say, where are we going to go? Bear in mind that the whole country was at war at this point and, um, you know, it was the fog of war was going on. We didn't know mm. which major supply routes were safe. Uh, we didn't know where there were Russian troops. We didn't know where there were Ukrainian troops uh, for that matter. Mm. And missiles were flying left, right and center, right? So it was a very, very uh, fragile um, uncertain time, and we were making pretty difficult decisions during that time. But when I say we were making them, the senior management of news organizations and the journalists on the ground were making those decisions. We were assisting them with that decision-making process. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and 
Yeah, and in in Gaza and the Middle East right now, it's a very mm. similar situation. I would say, you know, you're asking how we access different conflict zones. We have to find a way. We have to find a way to get into these places. It's not a question of are we going to cover them uh, or not. It's we are going to cover them. We have to find a way. And in Gaza, I'm been very disappointed to see that only CNN has managed to make it into Gaza with international mm. journalists. It's really left up to the Gazan journalists to report the story. Uh, we have not uh, really, the Israelis do not let international journalists into Gaza at this point in time. Mm. And therefore, there's the, difficult to find that independent verification of stories. I think the Gazan ju- journalists are doing an amazing job. But because they are Gazans, it allows one side to, uh, to smear them and say that their reporting is inaccurate. And you really need that international presence to say, this is what's happening and make sure that both sides can't contradict that message. So I guess it's a, a question of context, I, I, I presume. So in the Gaza situation, you, you're trying all angles, lobbying the Israelis, uh, tr- trying to find the, the ways to get through with humanita- any sort of humanitarian assistance you and observe anything along those lines, I, I presume. And just, it just... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, journalistic teams are trying to get in. Um, as Clarissa Ward from CNN has shown, it's possible to get in. Um, but, you know, the Israelis have stopped international journalists uh, mm-hmm. getting in, and they are also stopping Gazan journalists from leaving. So mm-hmm. um, they can't get out, even though many of them would like to because of the uh, very difficult circumstances they're living in. So, yeah, you know, it's a story that we can't mm-hmm. access, and uh, and it's a shame because we, we need mm-hmm. to be there. Okay. So, uh, look, we, we all talk an awful lot on this program about decision making and good decision making obviously starts with an objective of some kind, something that one wants to achieve. And you talked about keeping people safe. And I'm just wondering if we could think about this topic from the lens of just objectives, like balancing an objective of trying to cover a conflict versus trying to keep people safe. And how do you set the, the line and, and who, and who decides when you have sometimes you, you know, where, where, where does the, where does the priority lie getting the story versus keeping people safe? How do you marry those two things? Sure. So, I mean, what I would say from the beginning, you know, journalists are a self-selecting uh, mm. group of people and content makers are self-selecting. They, uh, it's a bit like the military, they've chosen what they want to do and they're very keen to get to that mm. uh, objective. It's a very mission-focused or purpose-driven vocation. Mm-hmm. And so I don't think there's any journalist who wants to lose their life or wants to be injured, uh, but they are very, very focused on what they're doing and they are very determined to get to um, their goals, and they are also very, very competitive. So it's a competitive industry. If another organization gets there ahead of you, um, it's it's seen as a sort of black mark of shame, right? You want to get there first and you want to tell the truth to the world. So competitive industry with enormous risks. But at the same time, people do risk assessment all the time. You know, they think about what they're doing, they think about if they can get away with it, and they uh, and they plan accordingly. So that's the culture we're in. Um, but it's very important that in news organizations that everyone has the same culture and the same tolerance for risk. And one of the big things that I did at the BBC and ITN when I joined is you have to have a training program that um, engenders this uh, uniform understanding of what is access- acceptable risk and what is not acceptable risk. Mm-hmm. And for example, when I worked at the BBC, I remember going to uh, the Sudanese, uh, so the BBC is amazing, right? It's it's got, um, at the time when I worked there, there was a language service for almost every language in the world, in the world service. And we had journalists from every part of the globe uh, broadcasting to their uh, to individual areas. And one of those uh, services was the Sudanese service. And I remember um, I was called in because they were doing an investigation into the building of a, a dam in a certain area. And they were really keen to do this story. And so we were discussing this with the team that were going to do this. And the local journalist said, you know, it's vitally important I do this. 
because it, this dam will have such a huge environmental impact on the area and it shouldn't go ahead. And I said, so what happens if they um, catch you? Because the authorities didn't want the, didn't want the BBC to cover the story. I said, what happens if they arrest you? And he said, well, I'll be beaten up, um, perhaps worse, but I, I accept that risk. And I said, yes, but, you know, your wife is there as well. Um, what about her? What will happen to her? And he very flippantly said, oh, yeah, yeah, she'll be beaten up as well. And I said, have you discussed this with her? Does she think this is an acceptable mm. risk? And he, he looked at me and said, no, I haven't discussed it. And I turned to his boss and I said, have you discussed this with this man's wife, that we're prepared to run this risk of harming his family members? And the boss said, absolutely not. We're not doing that. So basically... It's a little vignette. The journalists I work with might be willing to take the risk. We, you know, we try not to put family members, we try not to put children in, at yeah. risk for uh, the ambitions of, of the journalism. So, yeah. you know, but it's very clear in the BBC that that's just not acceptable. In other organizations, it might. How do you build a culture where that those principles are applied to decisions of many different contexts and stripes? Uh, well, it takes time. Mm -hmm. it, it takes time. Uh, uh, the way we did it in uh, the BBC and most European organizations is via training. Uh, something called hostile environment training was introduced. So all the people going to war zones have to do a course and they have to be refreshed on it. And during the course of that training, various messages are imparted. It's not just about the actual skills of mm -hmm. learning of, you know, medical first aid. Um, it's about uh, it's about risk assessment. It's about saying, you know, every day. Before, when you get up in your, and you're in a conflict zone, you look at the risk, you, you assess them and you say, what's my objective? Can I do this? Can I achieve my objective without getting injured or killed? And anyone on my team or anyone around us, uh, is that possible? And if it is possible, great, we go ahead. If it's not possible, um, let's have a discussion with senior management about it and reassess. So it's a continual, continual, you know, sticking your head above the parapet, checking out what's happening and then, uh, and then reassessing all the time. And that takes a long time to make sure everyone's in the same frame of mind. Mm. Uh, it's very easy to become over cautious. Um, mm. Because, you know, in a in a risk conscious uh, organization, it can easily become risk averse. So we always need to stay true to our um, ambitions and our mission and be honest about, you know, if we're if we're sacrificing that for safety. Yeah, it's a it's a hard tough line to get right i would imagine i'm i'm thinking the analogy that sometimes springs some i don't know if this is accurate but uh or a good one but it's it's that of uh say an athlete who's injured and wants to continue playing because they're competitive and uh the, the team has a decision to make about whether or not to keep them playing or they might want to i don't know save themselves for the what something else and the the team wants to push them to get onto the onto the pitch and and to play. Um, and so you'd have the individual's ambitions versus those of the organizations and how to strike a balance. I don't know if you have any thoughts on on that when those are seemingly not quite in alignment. How do you how do you resolve that? How do you deal with that? I like to think of it like racehorses. Okay. Good journalists are like thoroughbred racehorses. Okay. You know they're designed to race. And they yes. want to win and they yes. want to push to story. And, um, but sometimes you need to pace them during the race. Mm. They can't always run at uh, full speed through the race. And sometimes they need to slow down and sometimes they need to take a break if they're injured, as you said. So, um, you know, that's up to the trainers and the managers of those race horses. And similarly for um, journalists, there are people around them who are there to sometimes provide a bit of perspective. Um, mm -hmm. But I would hope that the goal of the organization and the goal of the journalists are the same, right? We all want to win. It's just how we get about uh, to that goal. Could you walk us through maybe a little bit of um, the the process of, of assessing risk and then ultimately how decisions are made to, to go in or pull out or go in with certain measures or conditions. If you just maybe walk us through the, the, the risk assessment process. Very elaborate risk assessment process, depending on um, what you're trying to achieve. So for example, investigations, if we're, if we're doing an investigation into a, um, 
criminal organization or someone who doesn't want us to uncover the truth. And there is a, a real um, jeopardy to lives and lives and limb. Um, we will go through a very extensive risk assessment, for example. Uh, same and with news uh, news teams that we're deploying into the field before we deploy them, we uh, will do the risk assessment. Once they're there, we've uh, we've accepted the risks, right? Mm -hmm. um, we expect them to dynamically risk assess and w work off standard operating procedures once they're in the field. But if we don't, if we're not prepared to accept their risk, we shouldn't have put them in the field to begin with, almost. Mm -hmm. Um, and those questions in the, in the risk assessment, they, they're the obvious ones, which are, you know, what are the person risks? Is it a risk of conflict? Is it missiles? Is it um, drone strikes? Um, I mean, let's just talk about the U Ukraine. The Ukraine is quite a good example. Mm. So we've got people who are operating in the Ukraine all the time. And uh, when they're in Kiev or Dnipro or Lviv, they're actually pretty safe, right? Uh, there, are, there is airstrikes and there, are, uh, there is bombing. But for the most part, they can operate without much disruption. Mm -hmm. um, but when they go to the front lines, the dynamic changes completely. Uh, when you're operating near the front lines, the level of incoming is much higher and it's constantly changing. So at the beginning of the war, it was an artillery war. And, um, you know, which basically means that if one side is firing artillery, the other side is going to respond, they're going to try and find that piece of artillery, and they're going to try and take it out, right? And so what both artillery units are doing on either side is they're doing something called shoot and scoot. So they shoot, they shoot them, uh, their round, and then they move their position to a safer location. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the counter battery, um, depending on how good the surveillance is, and detection uh, can take several minutes, uh, it can it can be very, much, much shorter than that. At the beginning of the war, we, you know, the Russian counter battery was like four minutes. So okay. when you fired off a round, uh, four minutes later, another, you could expect a round to come in. So you had four minutes to get out effectively. Mm -hmm. um, now it's so much faster because of drones. Drones are ubiquitous, they're everywhere. Uh, Russians mm -hmm. carrying out surveillance. So if they find a target, they'll take it out very quickly on the front line. Mm -hmm. And so that changing dynamic has led us to change our behavior. And we constantly need to look at what's actually happening, where the threats are coming from, and uh, amend our behavior accordingly. And, uh, you know, at the beginning of the war, lots of news organizations didn't use armored vehicles. Um, mm -hmm. Because armored vehicles, people think, you know, you get in an armored vehicle, you're safe. Uh, that's not true, mm -hmm. because unfortunately, armored vehicles are very hard to drive. They often are prone to road traffic accidents. So at the beginning of the war, the majority of incidents, I think, that were happening to news organizations were actually the car crashes. Mm -hmm. um, but over the course of the war, um, everyone's pretty much moved into an armored vehicle if they can afford to do so. And the reason being is the risk of being hit by shrapnel uh, if you're in near the front lines now outweighs the risk of a road traffic accident. So we're constantly balancing, reassessing, saying what's the probability of this yeah. happening versus that and uh, amending our, our behavior. Right. And so you're describing a very dynamic process. When people think of risk assessment, often it's, you know, sort of a, a big a magnum opus type of exercise at the beginning of it, you know, or alongside a decision, as opposed to what you're describing, which is constant evaluation, reevaluation, um, and decision-making in in real time how are how are certain principles applied in that in that context or is it still is there still a lot of individual judgment that that needs to happen because people are in the field so they you know the journalist needs to decide what to do what not to do okay so in the beginning we do a big risk assessment which you would mm -hmm. sort of um think about as your magnum uh, magnus opus mm -hmm. as you describe it right and we assess everything mm -hmm. uh and say should we do this thing should we sure. send a team to the front lines? Mm -hmm. um, now, it's important to note that from, a new, from an actual news creation perspective, that is not a mission critical uh, endeavor. You can still go up to the front lines without doing this risk assessment, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what that is, that is a compliance critical 
right. process and it is a safety critical process. Right. You can make right. the news without doing this risk assessment, but for the organization to tick the compliance box, they do need to have done it. And if something goes wrong from a safety perspective, you need to be prepared for what could happen. Mm -hmm. And therefore you need assets in place to do that. So we do do that um, magnum, uh, magnus opus as you describe it, to be ready for those contingency uh, situations. But a huge part of our risk assessment before we deploy people in the field is that they have standard operating procedure. And so this thing that I'm describing about armored vehicles, it wasn't standard operating procedure to use armored vehicles. It now is for many organizations. Mm -hmm. right. And so we are constantly evolving our standard operating procedure in the field. Mm -hmm. And we are constantly reassessing it and, and um, saying, is this, is this working for, for our teams or not? Right. And sometimes we get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's why journalists die effectively or are injured. And so we will look at what others are doing all the time and say, what went wrong there? Could we have done that better? Or, what, you know, what, what could have happened to stop this incident occurring? Mm -hmm. So that standard operating procedure is constantly evolving. And right. every and every week or every two weeks, um, the teams in the field, are their position is reassessed. Right. Okay. And that is, again, we do the Magnus Opus risk assessment. We say, should they stay there? We don't want to keep them right. there, um, you know, fairly happy. Who, who decides that? What, how, how does that decision get made? So every, or, every news organization has different standard operating procedures. So, mm -hmm. for example, I know some, some will only keep their people in the fields for two weeks on the mm -hmm. front lines, and then they will move them back. Others will do it for six weeks. Right. That is a resource allocation uh, issue. And um, a lot of it depends on the kind of news they're making. So okay. for organizations like the BBC or the news agencies, hmm. they are making multimedia product. So they will be making video, TV, text um, product. And it's the same journalists doing all those things. That is a very, very tiring task during mm. the day. And over time, over the space of the, your rotation, you will start making mistakes towards the end of your rotation sure. because you're tired from the sheer mm. task of cr creating mm. all this content. So depending on what you are asking your journalists to do, you amend the rotation that you have them in the field for. Mm -hmm. And those people who are in the corporate headquarters, if you like, do, do they, would they have had some experience in the field as well? Or does that depend on the news organization? It does depend on the news organization. Traditionally, mm -hmm. most managers have had field experience. Mm -hmm. um, I have to be honest, I have noticed, uh, I did notice during the Ukraine war that a lot of people who were in very senior positions um, were there for their digital skills, because obviously the medium by which we transfer the news to the, our, our audiences is changing dramatically right and so the priorities is uh, the priorities of management are changing as well and um so some of the managers who were dealing with de deployed teams during the ukraine war they had never experienced that kind of thing before because they had been hired for different reasons mm. um mm. so it was a very very sharp learning curve for some of them mm. i also ask because you know sometimes in lots of contexts when you're in a high stress high risk situation and also it's a mission driven profession these are mission driven organizations as well it it's easy to become blinded or become sort of very myopic i want to get the story i want to you know follow the whatever the conflict in a certain environment I want to be the first and you might make a decision in the heat of the moment that if you took a step back and you were to ask yourself 2 weeks before deploying would I do this? Like in your, whether it's in your hostile environment training or whatever, you might, you might say, no, I would never do that. Um, but in the moment, it might be a different, a different set of uh, parameters and maybe more difficult. And that, so my, the reason why I asked about people being in the field, sometimes who, people, those who know what that person is thinking in that situation on the ground might be able to act as a bit of a, 
as a bit of a, uh, a, a buffer or someone who is a wise, experienced operator removed from the adrenaline of the situation. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, I mean, that's how most news organizations are structured, that uh, decisions are not just made by individuals. I mean, there are some decisions that have to be made by the individual in the field, right? Um, we, But even then, so what we try and do is we try and um, have teams working together. Uh, we try and put more experienced people with more junior people so that there is a, a progression of experience or a passing of the baton, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I always say to our clients, you are not just factories factories of news. You are factories of journalists. We are we are bringing through the next uh, generation of journalists for tomorrow who will be covering conflicts after we've gone. And it's our duty to train them and equip them and get, give them the experience to make these decisions in difficult places. And that's the same as the management pipeline, right? We, we Managers are not just generally selected because... They don't have experience. They, you know, they're there because they have this experience to lend to um, the teams, and and it's actually part of the security teams present. That's why we're there. So, for yeah. example, in the Ukraine, in Israel, in the Middle East uh, war at the moment, the we have security advisors with the teams because they are are telling the journalists about the military tactics that are being used. Mm. And, you know, I'm not military, right? I, I'm not a field operator. I have security advisors who are vastly more experienced than me mm -hmm. at this kind of thing. And the story I'm telling you about the shoot and scoot in the artillery, mm -hmm. I don't know about that. That's mm -hmm. other people telling me about it. Mm -hmm. um, and we're learning from other, other people's experiences and then bringing that to yeah. bear in the field. Um, yeah. So, d you know, during the Ebola pandemic, we took doctors with us to help us um, manage the risk because that's what we needed. So mm -hmm. depending on what you're doing, you will take those experts with you uh, to provide the guidance that you need. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, I would like to maybe take a little bit of um, a walk through your, your views around how journalism may have changed and um, since you started and um, and maybe talk through the the importance of of international journal journalism in, in conflict zones. And we talked a little bit about the situation in Gaza. And sometimes you might people might think, well, why can't we just rely on locals with iPhones? And why do we need to send people to these places? And what's the what's the importance of it? And um, I, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that uh, and um, like why can't we just work with local journalists and verify iPhone footage and or use, I don't know, use use drones to get footage or what, what have you? What is the what, what do individuals, sure. human journalists, what do they bring that we can't get any other way? Sure. So, I mean, I think, look, we we're in a time of mankind that is which things are changing dramatically for us right and from a geopolitical standpoint uh, from a demo democracy standpoint um, from an environmental standpoint um, you know there are conflicting narratives about mm. what is driving climate change for example or um, what is driving migration or, you know, the geopolitical wars that are going on. And those conflicting narratives, there are people who want to control those narratives and they want to tell a story that conforms to them and either keeps them in power or in some way benefits them. You know, the point of journalism and has always been the point of journalism is to um, not to sound, sound trite, but, you know, to shine a light on on people's objectives and motivations and say, this is why they are telling you this story, mm -hmm. right, about climate change. And um, this is actually what is happening, because there are a lot of people right now in positions of power who are lying about things. And we want to show that they're lying and show the truth um, and allow the general members of the public to make their own decisions about what should be happening. And unfortunately, in the age of social media, I think, look, I think social media is a great thing, but it also allows this polarization and these echo chambers to be created in society. And I don't think those are good things for mankind. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And I also, I, I mentioned, you know, iPhone footage from local journalists who are of course journalists, but I, you know, presume that by having foreign correspondents also in conflict zones, there's, it, it, it provides a, a high degree, you know, much higher degree of veracity um, and impeding it against some of the narratives that, that may take place in social media. But I think it doesn't really matter what nationality or um, where the journalists have come from. What matters is the value and the quality of the journalism. And, can, and do they work for organizations that insist on that high level of quality? Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, I come from the BBC. That's where I sort of learned the journalism trade. For us to start making a program, an investigation, we have to do months and months of research and jump through all these legal hoops before we can mm -hmm. even start gathering the news, so to speak, or the content to uh, start making a, a TV program or a radio piece. Um, and we need to prove to lawyers within the BBC that our viewpoint is justified. Right. And that's the same with ITN and it's the same with the Washington Post and, um, you know, all the, the establishment organizations, basically, and the legacy organizations. That's why people trusted them. Um, and so that doesn't mean a startup in India or Nigeria right. or a local journalist in Gaza can't still adhere right. to those, you know, those principles and that quality right. journalism. Right. And, um, you know, they need to be taught how to be good journalists. Um, but there are newsrooms all over the world that do do that. Um, so what we want to see is quality journalism. I don't mind who's producing it, but I want it to be sure. reporting on the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How con concerned are you about AI in all of this and the prospect of you know, AI generated images, video and the rest? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, look, in terms of news manipulation, uh, AI is huge, right? Mm -hmm. uh, deep fakes, uh, the bots creating the story, feeding these echo chambers, uh, disinformation, news ma manipulation. Uh, AI is a huge part of that, undoubtedly. And it is a real threat to, uh, to good journalism. And it, it's, a, it's a threat to the trust that was held between uh, the public and journalists. So you can use AI to improve and make better journalism for sure. Mm -hmm. um, you can help, it can help with verification of stories uh, and open source intelligence, uh, but it also can be used in a very negative fashion. So I think we're on the precipice of a new age uh, when it comes to information. And I really don't know how it's going to pan out. Obviously, if I did, I would be a multi-billionaire, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, look, it, it depends if you want to see it as an opportunity or a threat. And right now, I think it's a bit of both, but I think you can't ignore it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't ignore it uh, is, is very true. I'm also wondering about the dynamism around decision making in, in this space, because if you think about so the private sector, thinking about a new investment in a new country or what have you, it's they have the luxury of time. Um, whereas in, in journalism, you're, you're following, you're following the news, you're following developments. And so something might kick off somewhere and you have very little time to make a good decision about how to cover it, where to go in. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that, if there's a, a way in which that works. So let's say something happens for the sake of argument in the South China Sea, like tomorrow, you know, how do decisions get made about when, how, who to deploy, especially when there's considerable time pressure? Sure. So, I mean, I think with all of these things, we all, we do have time, right? On our, we should always be preparing for our next stories in, mm -hmm. in media, right? And from a safety perspective, mm -hmm. where things go wrong is where we say, oh, you know, we don't need to do any training for hostile environments because wars are over. Right. Right. Um, mm -hmm. We'll never have another major land war in Europe. So we don't need to worry about that any longer. You know, if, you, if you have that mentality, um, then when when it does happen, you're you're in trouble. OK, mm -hmm. um, so you've got to look at the foreseeable risks and plan accordingly. 
And so I have colleagues, actually, I have a colleague right now flying to Taiwan um, to carry out some of that preparation hmm. in case something kicks off. Now, the likelihood is that it probably won't kick off, not this year, not next year, but we know at some points it's a, it's a um, point of friction between two major superpowers. We know something will happen there. So our, our teams there, our local bureaus, they need to be prepared for that. If you don't have teams there and you want to cover this story, how are you going to cover this story? You need to have plans in place. Sure. So that's what news organizations are continuously doing. What tends to happen is that um, when the story breaks, all those people you've trained to do the story, they're off on holiday somewhere. And <laughs> you've got to take people who are, are not prepared for that. Right. And you've just got to send them there and say, you know, mm -hmm. You do the job for the first three days while we get the people who we were trained and uh, prepared for for years for this. Um, right. So, you know, you have to have the pool of, of people ready to go. You have, they have to have some level of training. They have to be in the pipeline of, hmm. ex, uh, of, to have some level of experience before you send them out hmm. to the South China Seas to witness World War Three or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes for the first few days of the of the crisis, you're really jumping from hot foot to hot foot because you're not ready for it. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, I remember uh, one of the biggest stories I covered early on in my career was the Asian tsunami in 2004. Mm -hmm. And huge story, hundreds of thousands of people killed uh, in multiple countries. And it happened on Boxing Day, right? Which meant that all of our staff were on holiday or you know, we had skeleton crews. And we, and we were very heavily criticized as the BBC because we weren't fast enough to get there. Mm. And everyone was saying, where's the BBC? They're not there quickly enough. And, mm. you know, because we had to bring people on holidays and actually some of the challenges that we faced is we had crews turning up. Uh, we, we actually had some crews who were washed away by the wave, right? Mm. Uh, Roland Burke, the Sri Lanka correspondent, was, did the first broadcast from a tree that he'd been washed into. Um, so, you know, sometimes we do have pe assets there in the field, but we have to bring other assets to bear very quickly. And um, we had people turning up in beach shorts and sandals to, mm -hmm. you know, huge scenes of devastation. And they were getting their feet cut uh, on very sharp things, getting infections. We were then having to extract them and bringing in new people mm -hmm. with boots because we just weren't ready for that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And, um, you know, there will always be stories that catch you on the uh, unprepared you have to adapt and uh, and survive and move very quickly to change your behavior. And is there a type of story or um, other other types of things that the media is covering more now than than a decade ago? I mean, I guess a decade ago, maybe terrorism was was you know a, a bigger. A, a bigger headline. Are there things now that are maybe different, which create logistically different types of challenges? Or is it always, it's just kind of an open, <laughs> it's an open playing field there, you have to be ready for anything, natural disaster, conflict. Um, so sadly, I think one of the biggest changes I've seen in the media field is that there, you know, there is a real restriction in budgets. And so our ability to cover things that we, that I, I could have covered at the start of my career has mm. dis disappeared, you know. Um, mm. So a lot of programs, a lot of uh, story strands that would do the quirky things that other, you know, you, that were off the wall uh, or were not part of the headlines, those have gone, I think, because right. of budget cuts. And so right. there is a consolidation of news in certain stories. And, you know, right now, right now the big international stories are, the wars that are going on mm -hmm. uh, in in Middle East uh, and Ukraine, but for example, you know Sudan doesn't get any coverage. Sudan's having a massive war, but there's hardly any attention paid to that. Yemeni's been going, Yemen's been been going through a war for decades now, and it's only when they start lobbing missiles at, at tankers off the Red right. Sea that people start paying attention to it. Really, so you know the headlines are fickle, and news organisations have always been fickle, sadly. Um, but the story I think that is getting traction is climate change. 
we've always reported about climate change, but not in a really sustained fashion and without really connecting the dots. So, for example, um, we reported on migration and the terrible human tragedy of migration and people drowning in the Mediterranean Sea, but it was not connected to climate change. And at the reason why people are getting on ships to cross the Mediterranean Sea and risk their life is because they've got nothing back home because there's a drought mm. and they've got no food left at home. And that's why they're coming to Europe because they're desperate to um, be fed and looked mm. after, essentially. Right. And so that connection is becoming that holistic story is becoming much more um, part mm. of the the narrative, I think. Right. Uh, the, the world feels much more fragile and the the level of uncertainty and complexity always feels like it's ever increasing. Um, and obviously journalism has a huge role to, to play in all of that. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk us through your decision to start your own firm and what, what you wanted to, wh why you decided to, to do that, what the, what the objective was compared to just working in an organization. Sure. Good, good question, actually. Um, Mm -hmm. I guess the question would be, would I do it again if I had the chance? Um, yeah, would you do it again? Sure. Uh, so let me let me tell you why we started the firm, and then I'll I'll tell you I'll answer if we'd do it again. Basically, I could have continued working in news organisations um, as you know, moving from head of security to head of security uh, positions. Um, so so could have my business partner, I'm sure, um, but. The truth is there was a sort of a glass ceiling to how far we could get. We do a very specific thing. It's a very niche thing in that organization and they need us when they need us. And when they don't need us, they let us go off and do whatever we want effectively. So, um, there's a, a personal trajectory in my career that was, uh, had hit a glass ceiling, quite frankly. And so I, uh, and the other thing that I was very conscious of is that the things that I learned in the BBC, the structures that we built. And the ones that I then perfected and honed at, at ITN, um, there were many organizations that didn't have those structures that I hadn't really thought about it. And I knew I had a skill set to bring to bear uh, at other news organizations that uh, perhaps didn't want to spend the money on building a massive security team mm -hmm. to build this, but wanted to dip in, dip out. Right. So I had an opportunity that uh, we grasped. Um, and the same with my business partner, I think. Um, but um, you know, would I do it again? One of the things that we did do, which I, th I think we were a bit flippant, is we have built a piece of software that does risk assessment. Mm. And when we started building it, we were like, how hard could this be? Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why we started building it is because we see thousands of risk assessments every year. And they come in from different people, uh, different uh, news organizations, different departments. And the at the beginning, the vast majority of those risk assessments were very poorly written. And the reason being is people just didn't want to do them. They found them very burdensome, burdensome from a bureaucratic mm. perspective. And they said, what, and, you know, mm. and they, the common phrase was, this is just box ticking. And it's very, and very hard yes. to do. So when we really spoke to them about why they really struggled with risk assessment. He said, you know, does safety matter to you? I said, of course, safety matters to us. We really value the lives of our people. So it's not a question that they don't value the safety. They just don't value the process by which they have to put this down on paper. And I said, why don't you value this process? And they basically came back with saying, it's very difficult. We have to format these boxes. We have to, you know, we cut and paste from different, from old documents and then, the text is all wrong. And so we spent 90% of our time making documents look pretty, not actually focusing right. on risk. So we decided to build this piece of software that took away the, the, uh, the pain points of creating a risk assessment, streamlined it so you can get data out and um, you know make decisions based on data. Uh, and when we came up with this idea, um, you know, we thought, how hard could it be? And I now realize it's incredibly hard to build a piece of software. Um, right, and it's right. incredibly hard to build a piece of software that keeps everyone happy and all of our clients. And I'm pleased to say we have a lot of clients mm. using it, but it is a grind. And uh, so going back to your question, what, you know, mm. would I do this again? Um, the startup business is a grind and it's really hard work. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, you re you really re require your clients to pay you on time. 
Many of them do not. Mm -hmm. Many of them take months to pay you. And that means you have a cash flow problem when you can't pay your staff. Um, And these are just things that big organizations, you know, when you work for a big news organization, you don't feel that or a big organization in general. So um, being an entrepreneur, uh, being a small business owner is hard work, I would say. And are you finding just in terms of your client base, any any differences or any anything that it, that listeners might find surprising? Because I I presume you know, you're talking about you're not necessarily talking about the BBC or ITN. I, I don't know, but I mean th- there are all kinds of organizations around the world trying to do quote unquote you know I guess news of some of some kind. And I'm just wondering if you're if you're noticing something um different or um the the types of organ like did you ha- the, did you think that the types of clients that you would be working with would be the ones you actually are working with or and anything along those lines yeah so i think we work with pretty a uh, big blue chip um news organizations okay. you would you know okay. the names will be familiar yeah. to anyone yeah um, so they should pay you on time you know. <laughs> um we also work with lots of startups uh who um, basically, okay. there's a, the news media environment is very vibrant mm-hmm. at the moment. So there are uh, it's sure. a bit of a bit like Game of Thrones. Like right? there's a lot of consolidation going on in certain areas. Uh, there are a lot of new new organisations coming uh, to the forefront. Um, how long they mm-hmm. stay there is a different matter. Um, but you know, we work with um, lots of organisations who are producing information who are not necessarily news organisations. Uh, we work with a lot of charities and NGOs in the field. Um, yep. So, you know, there is a broad spectrum of people we work with who are taking risks, right? We work with anyone who's taking risks yeah. uh, from a physical safety yeah. perspective. And if they're putting people mm-hmm. in harm's way because of their mission, um, and if we can help them, we will definitely, uh, you know, we, we love to work with people who are doing interesting things, quite frankly. So, um mm-hmm. Awesome. And, and we love to work with non-linear organizations or organizations who are slightly mm-hmm. off off the wall um, rather than the standard yeah. hierarchical uh, organizations. So, yeah, yeah it's a, I mean, it's a fascinating journey and orga- organizations differ in the way that they handle risk. Uh, it's very personality driven, um, which I think you're seeing a change because of data coming through that's informing um, risk making a lot better and decision making, and you know what I, what I do a lot of is I work with senior senior management figures to uh, and boards for training them in crisis management um, decision making, and so that they have a, a mm. framework to apply to different situations, whether it's a kidnap or uh, you know a news story or right. a fatality. Um, but yeah, we're trying to apply. Um, good sense to a very emotional situation and when something like that does occur what do you find organizations who get it right what do they do compared to those that maybe struggle in those moments so i think um they've got to be mission focused they've got to know what they want Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. so in a in a big crisis i think some of them, some of it is obvious, right? So if it's a kidnap, you obviously want the person who's been kidnapped to come back, right? Um, mm-hmm. But a lot of crises are not, it's not clear what the objective is and what you can do. You obviously want to resolve whatever your problem is, but it might not be so easy to resolve that. And so mm-hmm. you need to be very clear and say, and this comes from the top leadership, right? You say, this is what we want to do. And, mm-hmm. and then various people in this management have to be tasked with achieving that goal. So I'll give you a prime example. In uh, 2021, uh, was it 2021? Yeah, 2021, when um, the US was leaving Afghanistan, lots of people were desperate to uh, take out refu- um, Afghans uh, from the encroaching Taliban on Kabul. And I, I work for the Committee to Protect Journalists. And this, uh, the head of the Committee to Protect Journalists said to me, we need to do something. We need to help these people. And I said, well, what do you want to do? What's the goal of the committee to protect journalists? And he said, I'm I'm not sure. Let me think about it. And he went away for two days, two or three days. And then he came back and he said, we need to remove any Afghan journalist who wants to leave. Um, And I said, okay, 
in order to do that, this is what I need. I need planes, I need the resource, I need, um, I need, I gave him a list. And I said, you go away and get that list for me and I will do, the, do this goal. Um, and he, to his credit, he went off and got those things for us. Um, he didn't pay for them. He got, you know, we had planes lent to us by different governments. Uh, we had lots, lots of logistics uh, lent to us by different people on the ground. Uh, we did not remove every single Afghan journalist from Afghanistan, uh, not even close to that, but we did remove 264 people and their families and children mm. uh, in a very short space of time. Mm. Um, and, you know, what you need in a crisis is clarity, you, clarity of what your goal is. And if you, if you tell us what you want to achieve, everyone can work towards that goal. And they're the, they're the organizations that get it right. Fantastic. That's, uh, that's great. I really appreciate this. We've covered a lot of ground. I did have one last uh, question, which is more around when do you, when do you not go ahead with something? When do you turn back? When do you, when do you say we're not doing this? I think there are often circumstances where the, uh, the thing that we're trying to do is not possible with the people that we have or the resource that we have available to us. Um, okay. And we need to go away and rethink the investigation or the story that we want to do um, and say, if we, if we really want to succeed in this, who's the best person to do this? And they might not even work for our news organization. They might work for someone else and we have to go get them from that different news organization uh, and do a co-production or something. So there are circumstances when um, you need to sit back and say, look, if we go ahead with this, we will get people killed. And mm. is that a price this organization is willing to pay? When you put it like that, very few people are willing to pay that price. Uh, I, no one has ever said positively, yes, yes, we want to get people killed in, the action, in this action, right? Um, mm. Mm. But what often happens is people are so determined to achieve their goals that they will deliberately um, hide from the truth. And they will do right. things that put lots of people at risk um, because they are convinced that their goal is, is a higher one. And I think we have to be humble and uh, know that, you know, we can't, you can't dance fast and loose with other people's lives. Um, and so, you know, you have to be honest about what you can achieve uh, with the resources you have and the personnel that you have often. Yeah, that's a, a great place, I think, to wrap things up. Was there anything that you wanted to mention that you don't think we adequately covered? Um, no, I think, I mean, I think we talked a lot about decision making and sort of uh, methodologies uh, in risk assessment. I talked a lot about, about news, right, news teams. I obviously work with wildlife yeah. filmmakers and people yeah. like that who you might uh, yeah. <laughs> they have a different sort of um, criteria. Fabulous. I, I think we often don't think about, and certainly in the world of dis business decision making, that that's that's not something that immediately springs to mind. So this is a really interesting take on all of that because there are, as you say, journalism is incredibly important, and in many ways, it's a more difficult way of making decisions because it's far more dynamic with fewer resources in many circumstances than other contexts of, you know, big, big decision-making. So this is, this is fabulous, really useful. Yeah. Uh, it's easy for me because, um, I work with mm. the senior leadership of news organizations who are mm -hmm. deciding whether to deploy people into the field and how to run those stories. But at the same time, they're also deciding the future of content making, you know, do they move to a subscription model? Um, hmm. how, how is news funded, all of these kind of things. So those are much bigger decisions that are much hmm. higher above my pay sc scale, which are traditional decisions. Um, I hope the methodology that we teach them in how to do things fast and quickly helps them with, uh, those bigger decisions. Hmm. Um, but who knows? I'll have to ask them next time. Well, who knows, but there's no other bigger decision in many ways than the lives of people. So the, the, the stakes that you're dealing with are incredibly high. So it, it, I guess it's an interesting question about priorities. Maybe that's a topic for another 
another episode, but uh, yeah. it is an interesting um, one. All right. So if people uh, want to learn more about you, your work, get in touch, follow you, what are the best places to do that? Probably just on LinkedIn. I'm very responsive on LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, so it's Colin Pereira uh, at HP Risk Management or RiskPal, which is our software. Mm -hmm. And if they, uh, if you linked in me, I'll, um, I'll respond. Fantastic. Colin, this was great. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat. Great. No, thanks, Ben.